Okay, uh, so good morning, all of you. Uh, this is uh, Ram Subramaniam. I'm uh, currently working as a professor of operations and uh, business analytics at Loyola Institute of Business Administration, Chennai. So more about me you can find in my LinkedIn, LinkedIn profile and the Google Scholar profile. Uh, so first of all, before I start the talk, I just want to say thank you to our community members, uh, especially to Mr. Vivek for providing me the opportunity to share my thoughts here. So uh, good initiative by Mr. Vivek on um, bringing together like-minded people on very comp contemporary topic of uh, AI and large language models. So let me go to the paper now. Uh, so before I move on to this uh, detail, uh, why this particular paper? Uh, this paper, if you look at it, this is quite different from all the other uh, talks that we normally have in our uh, community. Uh, generally, the talks will revolve around uh, the large language models, the technical aspects, the architecture side of it, and then comparison of uh, different models, prompting, and so on. So this particular uh, topic is quite different. I would not say completely different, but it actually leverages the large language models in a way. Uh, I thought you know, sharing this paper with you, uh, this was in fact, uh, published, I think, uh, quite a few months back. Uh, if I'm not wrong, somewhere during May. Uh, May of 2023 was when this paper got uh, published in the archive. So the importance of this paper is normally when we look at any uh, learning, uh, we tend to go with some classical approaches. And I will also talk about those uh, classical approaches in a minute. Uh, so this paper is kind of different in the sense that it sets a way forward in terms of how AI could uh, shape up in the future, how AI can probably solve more complex tasks. So we have been seeing a lot of news about AGI, artificial general intelligence, and so on. Uh, but then how are they going to shape up, right? So I... I thought you know when i uh, went through this paper this is a sort of a step which will eventually lead us to that uh, agi so from that sense uh, i thought you know this particular paper uh, these authors have done a very important uh, contribution in terms of developing this uh, software so they have named that as a voyager and the title is an open ended embodied agent with uh, large language models so before we even uh, start the uh, details about the paper, uh, let's spend a minute on understanding what is this embodied agent. Uh, I think uh, many of us, or at least uh, some of us, might have heard about this uh, term called agents. Uh, agents are normally you know, software uh, pieces of code uh, which are given a specific task, and then they go about accomplishing that task. And in many of the cases, uh, including our uh, latest reinforcement learning kind of agents, there also we extensively use this term called agent. The thing about these agents is they are going to have a very specific task to accomplish. So from that sense, this particular contribution makes a market departure from there. Uh, because here the agent is able to perform a wide variety of tasks. So not just a single task, the agent is able to do a wide variety of tasks. So, and, and this, another uh, important contribution here is it's all kind of autonomous, you know? So that's the reason why this particular contribution is uh, very important and uh, going forward, like you said, we may be able to see we're already seeing some of this in terms of OpenAI's uh, EF1 or O1, that uh, figure which they were uh, coming up in the news. So uh, this particular uh, paper is a very important contribution to the AI community. So now let's move on to the classical approaches to the learning. So these are all terms which you might have seen already and also familiar with. 
So let's just uh, go through it uh, quickly. So machine learning, as we all know, is a, a older kind of an approach uh, built primarily from the statistical learning and where we are interested in developing supervised and unsupervised learning models. Uh, then from there, we went on to deep learning, uh, very important contribution uh, since 2005, a lot of development that we have seen a lot of what we see today, including LLMs, are due to the development of deep learning. On the other side, we also have seen you know, the development of reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is a different sort of an approach to learning uh, in the sense that, uh, like I said, the agents which are involved in the reinforcement learning, they embark on a trial and error kind of an approach. So. Uh, the task is not uh, clear. They go about exploring the world or the environment in which they are uh, destined to do the task. So they go about exploring the world and then they sort of uh, learn along the way. So that is the reinforcement learning. And then we also have a field uh, where the idea of the deep learning and also the reinforcement learning are combined together. So the RL has got a limitation in terms of uh, computational complexity and so on. So very quickly, we can end up uh, you know, not getting answers and not getting solutions in a reasonable amount of time. So that is where the function approximators come in. And uh, deep reinforcement learning is a way of function approximation that makes the RL uh, learning much uh, quicker. And then we also have the imitation learning. These are all not. Uh, you know, separate mainstream uh, areas, but then they borrow ideas from, again, deep learning and uh, these sort of methods where they try to mimic the human behavior. And then we also have the transfer learning where uh, some sort of a generalization happens where uh, uh, if you look at the other methods, when we train a particular model for a particular task, we cannot normally use that same model for solving a different task. And that is where the transfer learning helps us to solve this problem. Uh, we can use the existing models and existing uh, um, you know, ideas. And then rather than building the models from scratch, we sort of use their existing weights and sort of modify that for a new task. So some sort of generalization, which we see in terms of the transfer learning. So all these are uh, termed as classical approaches. Uh, it might surprise you because the authors themselves have uh, said this. It's not me who are who's saying that it is a classical approach. So the authors themselves have given that in the uh, paper. Uh, so what are the challenges in the conventional approaches? Uh, there is no systematic exploration per se. Uh, the exploration is there only in terms of the RL and the deep RL that we see here in terms of the methods. Uh, so apart from that, uh, it's more an exploration of the gradients and how do we end up in uh, getting a local or a global minimum for a given problem. That is the focus of majority of these techniques. Uh, we also have the problem of interpretability, primarily uh, with the methods like uh, deep learning, deep reinforcement learning, etc. Because uh, we're not really sure what is happening under the hood. So these are black box type of methods, uh, which doesn't allow us to comprehend why a certain thing has happened and why a certain prediction has happened in that way. Like I said, uh, there is also a problem of uh, generalization where we once train a model on something, it's very difficult or it's even impossible to uh, use the same model in a different context for a different problem. So that is the generalization problem uh, which we face. So in a way, the authors claim that uh, this particular contribution of them uh, is overcoming all these issues. Uh, we can see that uh, in the uh, details which are uh, coming up in the other slides. So the underlying idea behind this uh, paper is the lifelong learning, um, where we uh, look at the agent, understand its uh, current skills, and uh, the agent is also given new skills to learn, and it's also able to refine its skills and also do a continuous exploration and uh, learning. So the idea is 
learning doesn't stop with a particular task learning gets extended for uh, multiple tasks so that is the idea behind this uh, paper so llm powered uh, agent is what they say and so where does the llm come in uh, this is where it is in terms of uh, automatic curriculum uh, skill library and the iterative prompting mechanism so the llm is involved at least in uh, two of these uh, activities uh, even in skill library to a certain extent uh, in the automatic curriculum uh, the llm is used uh, to generate new tasks for the agent which the agent can take up and uh, try to solve and then uh, as and when the agent learns new skills these skills are getting appended or added to the repository of the existing skill libraries. So when the agent starts the exploration, there is no skills that are available. So the agent uh, goes about exploring the world and then it keeps adding new skills along the way. Then we also have the iterative prompting mechanism, which is the heart of this entire uh, software, uh, basically all uh, using the idea of the GPT and LLM. Uh, in order to leverage the uh, reasoning capability of these methods. So the idea behind using the LLMs here is primarily to leverage the reasoning capability. Uh, when we look at the conventional approaches like reinforcement learning, the uh, exploration starts in a trial and error way. And then uh, beyond a certain number of iterations, uh, it sort of zeroes down on a particular uh, policy. Uh, but then there is no... Uh, reasoning there. In fact, if you take any of those previous uh, techniques that we saw, uh, there is no reasoning that is happening, except when we start using the LLM, we see that LLMs have been trained on vast amount of data. So they have the world knowledge within them. And so they have the reasoning capability and which we can uh, probably leverage to use that reasoning for accomplishing certain tasks. So the authors have used the LLM here for uh, coming up with the reasoning. And so uh, the context in which they have uh, accomplished this uh, particular uh, thing is in terms of the Minecraft. So Minecraft is a game. Uh, it's a 3D game uh, where the agent goes about exploring the world. And uh, this particular game is uh, different from the uh, other normal uh, 3D games that we see because it's a open-ended world, meaning uh, you can go on uh, building, you can go on uh, collecting new items, new skills. And, and so there is virtually infinite amount of possibilities that can happen in this entire world. And, and so that is why this Minecraft is a little challenging. For those who might be aware of uh, reinforcement learning, we already saw that uh, RL is able to solve, you know, specific games like uh, chess, uh, Go, and also uh, there is another 3D game in which RL agents were used. I think, if I'm not wrong, it's a StarCraft. So uh, DeepMind developed a software uh, to solve that uh, problem of uh, playing a 3D strategy game. Uh, but even there, it's kind of a restrictive atmosphere. Uh, like I said, RL agents generally are uh, you know restricted in terms of a kind of a task that they can do but whereas when we come to this kind of agents here the voyager kind of an agent it can accomplish you know multiple tasks it can generalize itself it can uh, come up with new skills and so it can virtually explore this world uh, go about uh, developing new skills and adding them to the library so that's the advantage of uh, this particular uh, software Now let's look at the architecture uh, used in the paper. So this is the architecture that they have proposed. So it consists of you know three primary components. Like I said earlier, first one is the automatic curriculum. Second one is the iterative prompting mechanism. And then third, we have the skill library. So it all starts from the left-hand side where you see that uh, circle. So the agent is thrown up new tasks starting from a simpler kind of a task and then uh, going much uh, ahead in terms of the complexity and the skills. For example, if you see here, uh, mining the wood log 
is relatively a lesser uh, skill compared to making a crafting table so making a crafting table requires a little more skill compared to mining the wood log and then uh, if you look at the next task that is given here a combat zombie that has again a different kind of a skill and also involves much more uh, uh, what do you say uh, reasoning and also execution capability so from that sense you know combat zombie kind of a task is uh, much more complex than crafting the table and even more complex than that is uh, mining the diamond i think if i'm not wrong mining the diamond is the kind of the ultimate goal in minecraft and if somebody reaches that stage uh, we can safely say that they have progressed in their skills so mining the diamond is supposed to be the hardest skill of all and so the agent starts from a very rudimentary kind of a skill and then uh, gradually builds upon its uh, capability and then goes about solving more uh, complex tasks so that's about the uh, curriculum uh, part and and then uh, how does this getting generated it's again uh, based on the gpt so uh, gpt is used here for generating the new tasks and whenever a new task is getting generated it's also then taken to the iterative prompting mechanism uh, they have used iterative prompting primarily to overcome the problem of uh, you know the troubleshooting and things like that we know that when we use an llm it's not uh, you know apparent in the first prompt that we get the answer which can be used to solve a task uh, many a time we end up doing multiple iterations before we end up doing or uh, completing a particular task and uh, especially this is true when it comes to a uh, uh, code right so generating a code and running that code uh, we all know that it ends up in certain errors some bugs will come and so they have used this iterative prompting primarily to overcome that kind of a issue so for every new task this iterative prompting mechanism comes up with a code and then this code is executed in the minecraft environment so the code is executed as an action in the environment here and then there is a feedback which comes from that execution which is again taken back to the iterative prompting and it's also taken to the self verification module that's again a gpt based module we'll see that uh, later uh, so the purpose of a self verification module is to ensure whether the program that is getting generated has successfully completed the task so it's like a checker where uh, we kind of uh, you know assess where whether the task has been successfully completed by the agent and then uh, once the agent is able to accomplish that successfully it's getting added to the skill library otherwise it's taken back to the iterative prompting mechanism and the program is refined so that the task is uh, you know successfully done in the subsequent uh, iterations and then when the code is also executed there is also a, a progress in terms of the agent's uh, capability and the skills and so that is stored as the progress uh, exploration progress uh, basically the agent state and and then this information is communicated back to the curriculum to throw up new tasks for the agent so this is a kind of uh, architecture and the uh, right hand side you see the skill library whenever a new skill is learned by the agent uh, it's getting added to the existing skill library and whenever a new task is also proposed uh, the agent first tries to you know take up uh, the top n kind of skills from here tries to see if it can use the available skills to solve the task if it's not able to do that then uh, the new skill is getting generated the new uh, library is getting generated new code is getting generated and then it again goes into the iteration so this is how the entire uh, architecture works I mean, dr rama this almost sounds like uh, a variation of reinforcement learning right so uh, uh, yes sir it sounds like reinforcement learning but the problem is there is no generalization there is no uh, you know multiple tasks but typically we are always uh, facing the task of uh, you know doing a particular thing in terms of reinforcement learning right so uh, and it's it's very narrow and uh, it cannot generalize so if we develop a rl agent then we have a certain policy and that policy can be executed only for that particular task so uh, there is no generalization there 
whereas here uh, there is a generalization in terms of generating new skills which is completely different from the reinforcement learning paradigm got it so how did you arrive at that curriculum in the beginning uh, yes sir we will come to that uh, okay. we'll discuss about the curriculum mm. um, in a minute a any other questions so far All right, so if there are no questions, we can um, proceed. So this is about the automatic uh, curriculum uh, that was mentioned in the previous architecture. So the agent has got what is called as the uh, states. So in fact, yeah, this will give us a more better picture. Uh, this is also available in the paper. I've taken this from their paper. So if you look at this uh, prompt detail, we can find that uh, basically GPT is given this uh, information uh, in terms of uh, some questions and answers and also status of the agent in terms of biome, time, nearby blocks, nearby entities, health, hunger, uh, equipment that they have, and then inventory currently the uh, agent is processing, etc. So this is the sort of information which keeps changing from time to time. And so this is where the state progress happens. And this is what is getting uh, input to the GPT. So on the left that we see here in terms of the diagram, uh, all these are different states. And then uh, they have given example of how these uh, different states are getting interpreted by the GPT. Uh, so for instance, if you take that uh, first uh, example there, it says uh, inventory five out of 36. So what this simply tells us is, uh, uh, first thing is uh, you can collect more inventory. And then if you look at the dictionary here, uh, you can also find it has some oak planks, then uh, you know quite a few sticks, then um, stones, and then wooden pickaxe. And if you look at the right hand side, this is the reasoning which was done by the GPT. So it's it takes up this particular status and it's able to reason that, you know, you have a wooden packs with you and also some stones. So therefore it is better to upgrade to a pickaxe rather than a, uh, sorry, uh, upgrade your pickaxe to a stone axe. So from wooden uh, axe, it's asking the agent to uh, pick up a stone axe. So this is sort of a new task. So from that, you know, it generates a new task for the agent. So the task is craft one stone uh, pickaxe. Again, this task is given in the format of the prompt. So the detailed prompting mechanism available in the paper uh, tells us how the LLM should give the output in terms of the task. So now that is again taken by the agent and then it goes about uh, building the skills. Can you go back to the previous slide? Yes, sir. No, not this one. There was uh, the other where you show the detailed prompt. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, here. So you are saying you are a helpful assistant that tells me next image task in Minecraft. Correct. My ultimate goal is to discover uh, yeah, as many diverse things. As many diverse things as possible. Okay. Accomplish as many diverse tasks. So that's a very generic uh, okay. kind of a prompt. But then down here, we find that. What, you know, what question answer are you giving there? Question one, answer. Uh, no, sir. That is not uh, clear from the uh, paper. It's not mentioned. Yes. They've given only the partial prompt. I see. And yeah. you're giving nearby blocks. Correct. Okay. So these are the. Uh, states of the agents basically so, so this is the whole this whole thing is a complex prompt yes sir yes sir oh it's very complex prompt okay in fact i have taken only a partial uh, thing from the paper it's in fact going down to another uh, half uh, page so it's a very big uh, thing that they have given in terms of oh. prompting no but uh, you can't have a big prompt right there's a context length limit so uh uh, uh I mean, the whole I think this uh, this fits into the prompt, sir. I okay. don't think this will uh, take up much of a token. Yeah, yeah. It, it should be very much uh, within the limit of the token. Okay. Limit. Fair enough. Okay, so this is the uh, other component uh, that we see in the architecture that is the skill library. So if we go back to that, yeah. 
in the iterative prompting mechanism we see here that the code is getting generated and then it is getting added to the skill library so yeah, so this is how the skill library component looks like so when the program is getting generated by the uh, gpt4 uh, on the fly so this is again on the fly so the code is not written up front so the code is getting generated as and when the agent has thrown up a new task and so once a program gets generated it then is taken through gpt 3.5 to generate a description of this program and so that description is then converted into an embedding so that is the novelty that these people have uh, come up with so how do we store the code so storing the code again is uh, uh, you know by using the idea of the embeddings here and so you convert the code into a, a program description and then eventually convert that again into a word embedding and so that acts as the key for uh, retrieving the program so the program itself goes as the value and uh, the key becomes your description which is stored in the form of a word embedding and so once you generate this key and value this is stored in the skill library and so uh, you have this names which are uh, stored in the skill library like mine wood log uh, combat cow etc and so these, these names uh, yes sir how is this embedding so they use any standard embeddings or that is also generated uh, it's not clear from their paper uh, might i don't know what sort of embedding method that they use they have only mentioned that it is an embedding that they use okay. so we're not clear on what should be the size etc but they would be using some embedding uh, right my Ada reasoning is they might be using ada embedding because it's based on gpt so yeah. they should be using something from the open ai embedding itself okay okay thank you And then uh, when there is a new task that is uh, thrown up, for example, craft iron pickaxe, you know, which we saw on that previous example. So that again is taken through the GPT and it gets uh, some sort of the uh, input based on how it needs to go about, the agent needs to go about executing this task. So it's generating a feedback kind of a thing. Again, that is getting uh, generated into an embedding this goes as a query to the skill library from which uh, you know pick a top five or top n kind of skills and then the agent uh, tries to use uh, some of these uh, skills and then if it's not able to successfully complete the task then it goes about generating a new code so that is how it basically works so whenever there is a new task that is coming up it uh, sort of uh, tries to use the existing skills if the existing skills are not uh, helpful in terms of accomplishing a task, then a new skill is getting generated and then uh, that gets added to the skill library. So it's an iterative process uh, through which this entire thing functions. No, so the above diagram is for generating a skill library. Uh, yes, sir. generating a new skill and storing it in the skill library. Hmm. And below, uh, below one is, is when there is a new query coming up, that is a mm -hmm. new task coming up. Mm -hmm. so that again is getting converted into a query. And that query is uh, used to retrieve the top n skills from the skill library. So mm -hmm. basically, what this means is the agent is trying to uh, use the existing skills mm -hmm. in order to accomplish a new task. So if it's able to do it with the existing skill, uh, nothing will happen. If it's not able to uh, accomplish that task successfully, then it should go about generating a new code in terms of new skill. Mm -hmm. So that again gets added to the repository. So over time, what we see is when it starts, it does not have any skill in the skill library. So it goes about adding more skills along the way as and when it completes more tasks. Very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. But yeah, a lot of things I think the paper has not talked about, it seems. So this seems to be an NVIDIA paper, right, uh, Dr. Ah, yes, sir. The primary oh. authors are from NVIDIA, correct. So they are obviously <laughs> one of the innovators. 
innovators so they open all the cards right so they are introducing their own uh, nvidia platforms true 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 makes sense because they also have uh, the hardware capacity so uh, have they given the 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 program github code or they have not open sourced the program software i have not checked that they have given enough information in the paper itself sir we find uh, uh, code uh, at the end of the paper they have given a uh, lot of information mm -hmm. not gone through those entire thing but uh, they have given uh, codes towards the end of the paper got it okay so this environment feedback is also another uh, component of this entire architecture where the feedback is taken from uh, the execution so when we go back to this here yeah so we see that the code uh, basically the new skill the new skill which is executed in the environment you know that new skill uh, it can be either successful or it may not be successful if it is successful not an issue but if there is a problem in terms of execution error etc now that is taken to the again gpt and then the gpt has a mechanism to self correct so i think this is pretty straightforward because we ourselves do this when we uh, generate new code we see that it doesn't work and then we again prompt the llm for giving a refined version and it's able to then give a better code so i think uh, that's the kind of uh, thing that they have executed here so basically they again use the gpt to self correct and if required it it is also having the ability to delete a particular skill and add something else on top of it so that's what is uh, given here for example here you see that craft acacia so there is no item named acacia x uh, so uh, go about doing a new new thing in terms of crafting a wooden axe so i'm not uh, clear as to what this uh, minus and plus indicates but i presume that these are basically indicating that those skills are getting deleted and new skill is getting added uh, am i right sir sorry you were asking a question ah uh, yes sir yes sir. i mean uh, See, we look at here, it says minus, and then uh, there is a craft uh, acacia axe, you know, uh, and then uh, you also have some plus symbol. So I presume that some codes are getting deleted and some codes are getting added. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen a Python construct like that, but. Uh, this is, I think, JavaScript, if I'm not. Okay. Fair enough. Looks okay. like a JavaScript code. Mm -hmm. yeah, it could be just a, a you know representative code that will delete those. Oh, and yeah. that. Correct. So this is the self-verification module which we see in the architecture. So on the right hand side, we see there is a self-verification module, again based on the GPT. So each time when uh, the environment feedback is taken, uh, GPT also tries to see whether the task has been successfully completed. So the skill is added to the repository only when the task is, has been uh, successfully completed by the agent. So if the task is not successfully done, then it is taken through the iterative prompting. Uh, skill is not uh, added. Only when it is successfully done, it gets added to the uh, library. So I think that is where the uh, verification module is giving a flag in terms of whether the task has been done or not. And uh, if the task is not successful, it's also giving a suggestion on what next to be done. For example, here, uh, there is a current inventory status which goes to the GPT. And the GPT is trying to reason this. And then uh, it says that you know the task is not successful. No, and no. then how is supervisor sorry how is this checking or verification working you send in the inventory and task into gpt4 and then correct. you actually ask it is this a correct correct you know whether the uh, task has been completed so uh, it it takes in this input 
and then it says that the task is not successful or successful so basically this is an output from the gpt itself but that that task and the event that skill was created by gpt so you are asking gpt for to introspect and critique its own previous exactly sir yes 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 so that is where the critique comes here so when the task is not successful uh, then the gpt suggests you know go ahead and mine something else so because of this the task was not successful so uh, when Why the critique is taken up here how can gpt4 correct its own previous behavior from before uh, i suppose these are all different uh, gpt modules sir i think so then uh, it has the ability to reason and also critic right so it's not the same uh, uh, thing that we are looking at the here we are looking at multiple uh, gpt modules okay so in a way we are asking the student to self correct their own previous no, i i think this is more similar to that actor critic algorithm uh, we yeah. have seen you know yeah. where we propose something and then there is a critic for that and then the feedback is taken and then there is a correction that is happening mm -hmm. so i think this is more to do with that uh, sort of a thing here so uh, yeah that is the kind of output which comes from the gpt so it is able to self verify and see whether the task has been completed or not so only when it is getting completed it gets added to the skill library otherwise the program gets uh, refined again yeah, interesting actually <laughs> very very complex also sir very not not uh, clear basically so it's a whole new way of of replacing reinforcement learning essentially so correct correct yeah so it's an alternative to RL. Yeah, we can think of uh, yeah as an alternative to RL exactly. So uh, when it comes to the model evaluation, uh, model evaluation for this kind of an approach is not uh, you know available. You know, it's it's not like we can use the existing benchmarks. So they have done uh, what is called as the ablation study. So what they refer to ablation is basically removing a certain component which they already have. For example, here in this entire architecture, we see that uh, it consists of primarily three components, right? So we have curriculum, automatic curriculum, iterative prompting, and then the skill library. So the way they have tried to benchmark this approach is they have tried to remove this uh, you know, components one or the other, and then uh, run the program, get the answer or solution, and then compare the results. So that's how they have uh, actually done the benchmarking. So it's more like a self uh, comparison, but they have also used a couple of other models. Uh, I think that's available in uh, some graph coming later. But so, primary means of evaluation for this approach is to. Uh, delete certain component, see how it performs, and then uh, add it back to the existing architecture. So that is how they went about evaluating this piece of code. Uh, so they have done in terms of three different ways, or maybe four different ways. So first one is the automatic curriculum ablation, where they replace the existing curriculum tasks with a random task. So this could be a random task, which also is given by, let's say, some human being. So a human being can give this kind of a task to the agent. The agent goes about accomplishing that. But this is coming from uh, not GPT. So GPT is not giving or generating this task. Someone else is generating this task. So this is what they call as the automatic curriculum ablation. And then they have also done what is called as the skill ablation, where they have you know, removed the skill library from the architecture uh, seen how it's performing and then uh, taken that also as a comparison so with and without the skill library they have done the study and then uh, self-verification ablation so they have removed that self-verification module seeing how it's performing and then also trying to compare with the full architecture so that is another comparison then the gpt they have tried both with uh, 3.5 and also with the 4 uh, 
they've used four wherever the reasoning is required because we know GPT-4 performs well in terms of reasoning capabilities compared to GPT-3.5. So GPT-3.5, they have sort of used it for mundane tasks. For example, converting to embedding or generating a program description. For this sort of lower, uh, lower skill tasks, they have used the GPT-3.5. For other more complex tasks, they have used the GPT-4. Dr. Rama, I don't know if you are familiar with curriculum learning. So uh, that was also something to do with curriculum uh, related to RL maybe. So this, uh, I am not privy to curriculum learning, but I'm assuming there is a similarity here, curriculum learning. Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. There is some sort of uh, similarity here. Uh, but then here the entire curriculum is developed by GPT itself. So that's the difference. Right. Right. So they've uh, done many comparisons in the paper. I've just taken a few of them here. Uh, one most important thing uh, that is a straightforward uh, impact of this particular architecture is uh, you can see that the orange colored one, that bubble is basically their architecture. So this basically shows the ability of uh, the uh, software or the agent to explore diverse set of uh, terrains and diverse set of tasks. So you can see here the other modules which they have compared is the React, uh, Reflection, and also AutoGPT. So I've heard about Reflection and AutoGPT. I've not heard about uh, React. Uh, so Reflection, I think it is something to do with uh, memory and uh, AutoGPT is yeah, autonomous uh, GPT agents, right? So th that sort of an architecture that they have tried to use. So those other uh, kind of architectures, they have not performed as well as their uh, Voyager architecture. So the size of the bubble indicates the uh, size of the map that the agent has explored. We can see that it's uh, pretty big compared to the other agents. So definitely there is a lot of improvement in terms of the uh, diversity and the exploration here and on the right hand side you can see also with regards to a particular skill so this example is for a task on uh, crafting a golden sword and uh, this purple and uh, the yellow colored lines are the other methods so the orange one again is uh, belonging to the voyager and so crafting the golden sword involves you know, completing these uh, specific activities in order. For example, the agent has to mine the wood log first, then it has to craft the table, then it has to uh, pick the wooden axe, then the stone pickaxe, then furnace. So it's a progressively complex activity. And so when you are reaching the craft of golden sword, then you are reaching the highest amount of skill. And uh, the other methods, we can see that it takes a lot of iterations to reach this uh, end. Uh, compared to Voyager, it's, it's able to reach it much more quickly uh, within you know, 10, 20 iterations. So performance of this architecture is uh, pretty good compared to the other ones. And uh, another thing is, uh, this is a zero, uh, zero shot uh, generalization, meaning uh, they have not given any examples. The agent is just going about exploring uh, just by using the instructions given to it. So all the performance uh, comparisons have been done with a zero shot uh, generalization. Okay, so the finding from their study is that uh, ultimately they find that all these are essentially required, you know, without which the agent cannot perform well. And so it requires automatic curriculum, skill library, self-verification, and also uh, GPT-4 for the reasoning capability. So uh, what they find is all these four modules are essential for completing the tasks successfully. Yeah, so this is one of the thing. I will probably show this. Uh, so this is the one which they have given in the abstract as well. So on the x-axis, we see that uh, it's all number of iterations. 
so 0 through 150 plus kind of iteration that we see on the y axis we have you know different items that are being collected along the way uh, so the auto gpt and reflection or this uh, bottom ones here so we can see that the number of items collected by those uh, agents are less in fact the poorest one is the reflection it has collected only three uh, auto gpt does somewhat better uh, but then its number of items are uh, less compared to the voyager without the skill library so this difference uh, shows the impact of removing the skill library from the architecture so the blue line tells you that without the skill library you cannot collect more items and you cannot progress and so if you add that skill library into the architecture the agent is able to collect you know a lot of items here it's also able to collect the diamond tool so interesting to note, uh, diamond tool is kind of uh, the highest form of skill and no other agents have reached this stage. So this particular architecture which they have proposed, that agent has done that. And it's also go about, uh, gone about exploring further. It's been able to collect more items along the way. So that is the sort of performance which we see from this uh, graph. They've also given uh, detailed limitations uh, from their study. Currently, it does not support the visual perception. So this is all happening um, as a code, and there is no image that is uh, being read. So there is a scope for multimodal models here, speech, uh, video, etc., or image. So all that can go as an input. and. Uh, human as a critic and a curriculum proposer so this is also something that they are suggesting this is more like a rlhf kind of a framework that we see in the llm right so human as a critic and curriculum proposer they say that uh, humans need to be brought in here in order to develop it uh, much more uh, better way and then cost of gpt4 of course they say that it is expensive and so they have been limited in terms of the budget and so if they are able to go with you know much more uh, cheaper or affordable architecture they may be able to do a better experimentation and then there are some inaccuracies that they say they have documented in the paper and uh, this gpt is also known to hallucinate so that is also as experienced by the authors uh, in the process during the experimentation so these are the limitations that they say of the entire uh, paper yeah, I think uh, that's it, sir. Awesome. So uh, you are saying uh, they have they published uh, a GitHub uh, open source code demo? You said it's at the end of the paper, huh? Uh, it's in the end of the paper, sir. They have given it at the end of the paper. OK. Maybe you want to just show the paper quickly, uh, the Voyager paper. Uh, yes, sir. One minute. Dr. Anima Anand Kumar, she is a, a senior sir at uh, NVIDIA. I think they have given a GitHub uh, repository as well. You can see here. Mm -hmm. it's there. Got it. So auto GPT is something similar as per your understanding, huh? Uh, auto GPT, I think it is uh, utilizing multiple GPTs to accomplish different tasks, if I'm not mm -hmm. wrong. So basically, you give a task to auto GPT, it is sort of uh, able to come up with more tasks based on that. Basically, it's trying to divide and conquer a complex task that we give. So it's mm -hmm. able to divide that into much more simpler tasks mm -hmm. and then uh, goes about uh, solving one by one. OK. So much like our uh, this thing, when we try to give a prompt in uh, GPT, so it, it sort of has to decide whether it should browse the web or not. So for, for certain prompts, it's able to search the web. For certain things, it's able to give from its own domain knowledge. So maybe that sort of a thing is 
what auto gpt does mm -hmm. so let's see yeah they've given detailed prompting towards the end of the paper so um, here the skills what it learns right those are related skills or uh, how, how, for a given domain right so when i try to add skills right so they okay. should be a related skills or they would be kind of diverse skills or uh, is there is something sir, it can be it can be related or it can be diverse sir uh, there is only one thing that they have mentioned uh, clearly yeah. that is if the agent is not able to successfully complete a task then it goes about generating a new code so that new code is basically a new skill and so this new skill could be closer to even an existing one maybe an incremental improvement over the existing one uh, but it can also develop a completely new skill based on the task which has been assigned okay and mm -hmm. what what kind of applications do you see like autonomous cars kind of stuff where do you uh, see yes that? autonomous cars is one application where we can definitely think about yeah. i mean wherever you know there is a lot of exploration challenge. lot of exploration that is required lot of tasks need to be completed so i think those are all the places where we can think of using this kind of an architecture so but once you kind of attain the skills right then you can exploit the skills so uh, yes yeah. sir that they are in fact doing it that's where the embedding comes in so whenever a new task is given the agent is trying to see if it can use the existing skill if it is not able to successfully use that then it goes about generating a new task or a new skill yeah no, the way i'm looking is that let's say i kind of learn some skills sort of that right i can kind of fine tune my model with this i can take any model now right any large language model small model and then kind of fine tune with the skills so that it is i can say that uh, ah, so i can I exploit that will be an issue sir because Right. See, when you are doing a fine tuning, you are normally aware of what task that you need to perform. You know what should be the output. Whereas here, it's not clear in terms of what will be the task that is coming up, right? Because the GPT is generating a new task. And so it can come up with any task. And so it will not be clear up front whether... No, 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 not that way. I may be wrong, but I'm trying to say is that let's say that i had created some task and i explored it and i create end up creating say say 20 30 skills right now okay. i know that what these skills are right mm. i don't i'm just asking like mm. is there a way to know what skill this has acquired as a human ah uh, yes sir because it's basically a code right it is yeah. uh, at the end of the day it's generating a code yeah. so once you decipher the code and you are also generating a description of the code so yeah. you should be able to know what is happening inside that exactly. is why this method is also yeah. interpretable so that i'm saying let's say that as a company everyone may not be able to do exploration right once i explore i generate some skill create a knowledge of skill base and then I can use small generic language model or any model for that matter and fine tune that skills with that model so that now I can limit to certain tasks which will be really useful for that kind of skill. I'm I just, think that is possible, sir. Yes, sir. Possible. Yeah, because yeah, that will really help, right? Because see, some big company may who have money, they can do all this stuff, right? And they can kind of uh, the skills that have generated can be exploited, should be exploited, right? So everyone should not end up only exploration. So yeah, I'm just I don't just contemplating thoughts. I don't know, maybe wrong, but yeah. No, so it's just that this problem is completely different from the normal ones that we see. Yeah. See, when we look at an LLM, right? We are Based with a particular uh, set of tasks, maybe a chat completion, maybe a question answering. Those are all the limited set of tasks that we are trying to use. But here, the task itself is not clear. I mean, when the agent starts the exploration, there is no definition of task available. So it's, it's starting from a zero or a scratch, and then a new task is getting generated. So it's it's basically if you look at this entire environment of minecraft it is a 
open ended world it's much like our humans right we we uh, we are situated in different places each humans have our own kind of experiences each of us go through different skills we have different set of skills and so uh, that is the sort of uh, environment where we can think of using this kind of an architecture so somebody suggested autonomous uh, vehicle yes autonomous vehicle is uh, again it's a limited environment but yeah. then there is enough amount of complexity there where we can think of using the agents there so uh, that is one sort of an application otherwise like uh, mr vivek was saying you know this looks like more an alternative to the reinforcement learning i also see it in that fashion because wherever the reinforcement learning was not able to do now this method is able to show up the reasoning capability so going forward i think uh, if we can combine reinforcement learning along with the uh, llm uh, so then we can see you know a lot of improvement there yeah i mean things like stock market you know portfolio management or supply chain optimization demand correct, forecasting, correct. demand forecasting you know, uh, oil exploration yeah uh, oil exploration would be an interesting area uh, uh, you know chemical formulation so wherever we had rl going on exactly uh, wherever rl going on the disadvantage with the rl is uh, it is very computationally complex uh, very expensive to run and we are not sure whether we will uh, get the answer in a reasonable amount of time so this is able to now reduce that uh, problem because we are, if we are able to tap on to the um, uh, tap into the knowledge of the gpt so then we can use its uh, reasoning capability to solve all these problems i am fascinated by what all llm are enabling right the whole concept of llm is disrupting the world literally correct and, uh, even the older way of doing machine learning ml dl rl is being disrupted right <laughs> so correct correct so uh, this uh, llm is disrupting all old forms of ai it seems to me so, so for example i was just thinking you know if we can use this uh, llm capability let's say inside a decision tree or a random forest rather than exploring all those variables Uh, without any knowledge uh, we take random forest then we take subset of variables but then how it is taking the subset it's it's more like a random behavior if we can bring in the reasoning capability inside then probably we can uh, get the answer much more quicker so any other questions audience uh, fabulous presentation by dr rama subramaniam uh, any other questions so i do have one question um maybe maybe it's going to be one of those dumb questions <laughs> if you can no go to the slide Ask one me. right <laughs> yeah so uh, i, I am from a hardware background you know just just a disclaimer so <laughs> so you know uh but if you can go go to the slide number 1 i believe you mean this one uh no i i think i think the slide number 3 sorry 3 yeah yeah so so these are the different approaches you mentioned right for achieving right. certain goal so i yeah. I, i want i want to take maybe one or two steps back right what are we trying to approach what are we trying to solve here so what is our input and what is our output okay in terms of this paper No, in terms of this this generic problem, right? So this uh, are, so you said okay, classical you approach is about these learning. methods. These different methods. You are asking about these different methods, right? Uh, well, so you know, like if we take one step back, right? Let's say we call this whole thing as uh, deep learning, or I don't know, you know, like AI learning, or whatever, whatever name you want to give it. Okay. Uh, so what are we trying to approach with that? Like, what is the input? Is the input the data, and what is the output? like i'm trying to understand at a very high uh, level that what are we, what is the goal of this so the goal of the entire exercise is to predict something right so if we take uh -huh. all of these methods here we are in a way by using the data you rightly said that you are uh, looking at the data points so this data could be you know anything it depends on the context for example if you are looking at uh, sales at a store 
then the sales at a store could be function of uh, the uh, size of the store, uh, the amount of years it has existed there, uh, then the kind of people who come to buy the items and things like that. So we use those kind of data as the inputs to predict, let's say maybe what would be the sales in this particular store in the next month, the next three months, in the next year, etc. So in a way, all these methods which are listed here are trying to do that. So they take in certain uh, set of data and try to predict something based on that. Got it. Got it. That that was yeah. That was one one question I had. The other was like the different uh, methods here, right? Are, are they uh, so they could be like a, if we if we have to think about it, right? So it could be that they can be a vector along the evolution of the of the technique, of the technique. right? And and another vector could be. Uh, really? along uh, the applicability of so, uh, different problems and so and using those uh, techniques yeah, to solve yeah. those problems yeah yeah just i'm finishing the webinar yeah. let me come down after that okay all right see you okay yeah so so in terms of those two vectors right the evolution of techniques and applicability of the techniques for specific problems do you Correct. think you know all of these are like uh, sort of uh, along the evolution uh, vector, or you think that there are there is some applicability some of, of certain techniques? Are, some certain of them problems. are some are uh, actually uh, evolution in terms of parallel. For example, if you look at deep learning, deep learning evolved from machine learning. So machine learning was the oldest one. So deep learning uh, built upon the techniques of the machine learning. But reinforcement learning was a completely different paradigm. It was an entirely different kind of an approach. The way the uh, prediction comes up there in that method is completely different from what we see in a method like, let's say, deep learning or a machine learning. So reinforcement learning uh, is a different paradigm. But otherwise, if you look at this deep reinforcement learning, it's a marriage of both deep learning and reinforcement learning. Like I said, these Deep learning and reinforcement learning, these two are, you know, completely different kind of an approaches. So uh, the idea here is, can we marry the concepts of uh, deep learning and the reinforcement learning to accomplish a certain task? You know, that's the idea behind deep reinforcement. So this again came only after the deep learning evolution mm. came. So it's an evolutionary. Concept, so from top to down, yeah. it's more of an evolution, right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And all okay. this transfer learning, these are all things that we see in the past, you know, three, four years. So yeah. it were not there, uh, it was not there before. So the ideas of transfer learning, imitation learning, these were all not there before. So in a way, this is also telling you the progression of the uh, entire stuff. But reinforcement learning alone, I say it's a different uh, paradigm. And it goes back to, you know, 30, 40 years. Got it, got it. Okay, and 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 a side and a very different question, right? So you talked about this paper coming out of Nvidia, and Nvidia very clearly is the market leader, at least on the on the AI hardware side, right? And it has Correct. excellent projections, earning projections, and so on for the next foreseeable future. Correct. But th there are other other competitors to Nvidia as well, at least uh, if not on the public markets yet. But at least on the on the um, you know uh, like uh, uh, on, the, on the theoretical side of things, right? So like like Samba Nova is something I hear is also a hardware company. They're trying to develop similar hardware like Nvidia. So in terms of the publication landscape, what different companies? You know, if you can talk to talk to that, that what different hardware companies or software companies? Uh, who are really heavy in terms of innovating and uh, coming up with new things actually uh, as sir in interest of time we'll have to wind up this webinar uh, so uh, feel free to have an offline conversation uh, uh, so dr rama you can share your uh, you know uh, coordinates here uh, oh, yes and, yes sir uh, so uh, So uh, uh, thank you all for joining. And thanks, Dr. Ramasubramaniam. Excellent presentation. And Dr. Ramasubramaniam is a professor uh, at, uh, I believe, a college in Chennai. 
and uh, uh, dr rama you can put down your uh, contact coordinates so folks can reach out if they want to talk to you and thank you all for joining and we'll share this recording with our ai lab community if you are not part of our community and uh, uh, you know do reach out through uh, our contact given on the meetup page and uh, we'll be happy to add you to the community and explain you various research programs which we have and uh, thanks a lot all for joining thanks dr rama excellent presentation Thank and you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.